think the wanting to share this particular song is, is kind of a significant because I never actually got given a copy after I recorded it. Um, I had to, I think I found the CD and paid for it, which was probably quite expensive because it was quite an obscure CD. And then years later at Plastic Wax, a friend of mine, Martin, um, he rang me up and said he'd found the vinyl version. I was like, what? And he said, that, but there's only one record in there and it happens to be the one with your, <laughs> with your song on it. So I got down the shop, got the actual record and it was in mint condition. Um, and then last year my stepbrother died and in his collection, I, within it had a CD which had the original track on. I thought, hang on a minute. So he was basically, he was following me through his musical, my, my stepbrother introduced me to mixtapes as well. So I've ended up with all his collection now. It's just been given to me recently. And I, I just felt it was quite a significant song to sort of talk about. So basically the piece of music I've recorded was basically back in 2000, Tony and I went up there and I, I didn't actually know what the title was going to be or anything like that or what the song was. I literally arrived complete strangers in a studio in Covent Garden and they said we hear you sing I thought, yeah <laughs> so they chucked me in a booth and gave me a piece of paper basically saying that they'd found it in a in a second hand shop some lyrics I thought okay so I took the lyrics and I just freestyled for two days basically we spent two days in this studio and they were in the middle of recording this album so I just kind of came out of this sort of poetic performance, which is a little bit Grace Jonesy, actually, my stepsister has told me. <laughs> um, so yeah, along the way, I never actually got given any copies of it. I've had to search them out myself. Sort of, I don't know what we had there. But yeah, so I had access to vinyl from a young age and sort of used to hijack my mum's records. I think before we could get into a club, we used to go raving. So before nightclubs came fields and sound systems in the middle of Somerset. Uh, the first ever rave I went to was called Obscurity and it was in Pease Down St. John. I've got the flyer for it somewhere. And it was just basically like weird repetitive beats and lots of people doing weird things sort of running around on LSD sort of people just experimenting <laughs> like in whatever year it was. Um, but yeah, it was a load of people from Bristol. A lot of DJs from the house scene were playing. Uh, people from the FBI crew would be in the middle of a field. And a guy called Chris Cross, who's actually now the organiser for the VegFest on the harbour. He's the DJ. He actually rescued us going, what the hell are you doing here? Go home, you're far too young. And he, they chucked us in a van and brought us back to Bristol, basically. I suppose the beginning of the career was my brother. He lived in Brighton and in 1988 he left home and went to Brighton, Sussex University, so I used to be thrown on a bus and told to go and stay with your brother, so he had to look after me. And when I got there he, he and his friends were all DJing at the Zap and the Asylum and different clubs and within the campus, so he used to do campus radio. So I'd be in his bedroom, he'd be out playing and go, right you stay in, <laughs> you're too young to come out and I'd be listening to campus radio with my brother Roly on the radio. So I taught DJing for 10 years before, the, before any of the sort of Colson Hall and the basement studio sort of stuff. So I taught quite a lot of people how to mix, but it was always about how I interpreted it. So I'd explain it from my point of view and I'd say, well, look, this is what you, we've got and you learn it for yourself. And, you know, and I grew up around DJs and who had skills like this Lynx guy who I, He's, have you heard of Lynx? No, so Lynx is 3pm. Uh, he's like the first ever scratch on Smith & Mighty's music. The Smith & Mighty, the first gig we did was 98. It was Lakota. Um, I can't remember who was in the main room. We were in the back room, so me, Rob and Ray. I was singing to a 12-inch cut of my voice, but the instrumental. So it was me with fake eyelashes on, <laughs> sort of doled up, my friend did my hair. And then... Uh, my brother was there, which was, his friends all came as well, and they were like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, sort of a big night. But after that, um, to 98, kind of came the, the DJ Kicks album. Off the back of that came the single, which was I Don't Know, which was the track I wrote, which appeared on the DJ Kicks as a sort of 
a like bonus track or something like that. Um, and after that, I, I did the Big World, Small World album, which I turned down a US tour because I needed to pay my rent. So at the time, I was working at a record shop on Park Street called Replay. And so I was the, the dance specialist on a Saturday. So I had to basically pay my way. And I knew by being on tour, I wouldn't earn any money. And I had to keep, you know, paying for my car or whatever I had. I used to shop in Replay all the time. I spent an absolute fortune on vinyl. Um, so one day, I, I don't know who gave me the job. I must have just gone in looking or saw a sign in the window. And I went in and ended up working there for about a year and a half. And I would do like three days a week. Uh, all the original R&B boys used to come in on a Saturday going, where's the freshest hip hop that was coming in in R&B? The US imports, so I, I used to get a lot of imports. Like when Jill Scott came out, when her album came out, I was just sort of, oh my God, vinyl, yeah import CD. It was 18 quid for the vinyl. It was like 15 for the CD. This was like 2000. So it's a lot of money to spend on my, I only got three quid allowance for every shift. So every day you worked, you built up three quid each day. Plus you get a 20% discount. So each week all my wages were basically just going on vinyl. You could plonk me on a stage in front of a thousand people and I wouldn't feel, you know, perturbed at all. Whereas singing, I'd be petrified at the thought of kind of revealing my soul sort of thing that's the difference there's no soul in the well there's soul on the record but not my own soul exactly <laughs>